The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, my partner, Malik Hill. It's September 1st. We are in September, which means... Week one. Week one. It's, it's finally here. football season. The fans are back. The bands are back. The atmosphere is back. Real college football. And we have to take one quick side aside real quick before we get into the meat and potatoes today. We forgot to mention last week. Miguel Cabrera hit his 500 home run. <laughs> yeah, just ran out of time. Too much football talk. So, but, um, yeah. congratulations, Miggy. Pretty cool. I wish he could have done it at home. Yeah, I mean, the good that thing, though, bad. it did happen in Toronto. They still so, gave him a standing ovation. So there was so. plenty of fans that could make it yeah. um, if they were diehard fans. The unfortunate part was the ball went into the bullpen, so nobody got to catch the ball. Yeah. But I thought I'd bring that, that up. Miggy got 500 home runs on a... Short list of greatest of all time. Okay. Now, college football, full swing. This is the Big Ten preview show. No other football is going to be talked about today. Next week, we're going to talk about the Lions, which is also going to make me sad. Also going to make me sad. (laughs) So today, we're both going to be a little bit sad about college football, maybe. And then next week, we're going to be real sad about the Lions. But we got to do it. That's what we're talking about. Big Ten preview. And we're starting with Malik. <sighs> Malik, what are the Wolverines looking like in 2021? Listen, man. This team, this school, this this program, they they just they they've taken so much from me, but they've also given me some happy moments. It's it's been few and far between, but we're we're back again, 2021. Jim Harbaugh back sixth season. I can't believe he's already in his sixth it, season. It's it's crazy, isn't it? It is insane. I remember like that first season, his the the first two seasons, twenty fifteen and sixteen. I remember watching every single game. Mm-hmm. Like I have so many memories from those, but it's 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 gone by so fast. Year six, the hype was real back then, and there was good reason. Twenty fifteen, he steps in. They go ten and three immediately. Mm-hmm. 2016, they are a playoff team. And we got a preview at the end of that season of what was to come for the rest of uh, what's been his stint at Michigan. They start out, I think it was 8 0 that season. They were smacking everybody. Mm-hmm. Go to Iowa, lose at Iowa. Nothing to be ashamed of there. Everybody loses at Iowa. Then you finish the season 1 and 3, losing the bowl game and finish 10 and 3. I had high hopes after that one. Yep. Lost to Ohio State in overtime. Really close game. If it wasn't for a few turnovers and some mistakes from the quarterback and the team overall, should have beat Ohio State that year, should have made the playoff. But there was hope after that. Injuries happen next year. Somewhat of a reset. Eight-win season. Next year you get Shea Patterson. Bunch of talent coming back. Going to the Ohio State game again with a bunch of hype. Going to halftime only down by three. And you lose 56 to 28. Yeah. Next year, you bring in a new offensive coordinator. Same defensive coordinator, though. Don Brown is back. 2019, oh, 2020, actually. Yeah, 2020. 2019, 2020 season. Yes. Fresh offense. Takes a while to get things going. And they go nine and four, lose to Alabama in the bowl game, and they get slaughtered at home against Ohio State this time. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's disheartening. 
Last year, I barely count last year's season. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Don Brown's defense completely imploded in, on itself. Lost to Michigan State. Lost to year one Mel Tucker, Michigan State. And, yeah. and his whole plan was just chuck it deep. Yeah. Because the defense isn't good enough to handle that plan. Yeah. Just chuck it deep. It was literally like watching somebody play NCAA football on With no Xbox. experience. And they just With say, no experience. Go routes. Listen. Go. 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 Jim Harbaugh hypes up Zach Charbonnet coming into the season and then benches him within three games. Mm-hmm. Now he's at UCLA and he looks like a monster. He played great in his first game. <laughs> Joe Milton has all the talent in the world, but the accuracy issues blow up in in all, all of our faces. Yep, never was able to figure it out. Offense still was stagnant. The only times there was slight energy was when Cade Cade McNamara would come in. They barely beat Rutgers in three overtimes, which was embarrassing within itself. I was happy they shut down the season because it it just wasn't it wasn't yeah. working. Mm-hmm. Everything just hit the wall. Yep. So we got a brand new season now. Jim Harbaugh brings in a brand new defensive staff and a lot of new offensive coaches. Mike Hart is back, not as a running back. It would be great if he was back as a player, (laughs) but he's back as the running backs coach. He did a great job at Indiana and Eastern Michigan before that. Mm -hmm. Fresh face for Michigan. You got Mike McDonald as the new defensive coordinator. Got him from the Baltimore Ravens. His brother sent him over. Said this this guy might help out, freshening things up with Michigan. Brand new look. He's going to bring in multiple different systems and looks on defense. We're going to have to see. We're just, we're just going to have to see. He's a, he's a young face. According to John Harbaugh, he, he knows a lot about defense and he knows what he's doing. So mm-hmm. we'll have to see there. Josh Gaddis back for third year, I believe. Yeah. In this Listen. offense that was uh, known as the speed and space. That's what he kept saying, speed and space. That, that's what we're going to bring to Michigan. Yeah. Didn't fit the offense that he came into first year even though they still won nine games. Things started to pick up near the end of the season. Last year, it it just didn't mesh. And I don't know, man. This It's it's so hard to believe in this Michigan program right right now with Jim Harbaugh at the helm, even though he's done, he's made steps to try and fix things. It's a first-year defensive coordinator. Josh Gaddis still hasn't gotten what he wants out of the offense. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's there's talent, but Jim Harbaugh hasn't proven that he can develop the talent that they have to the highest level. You've brought in so many high-talent players with four- and five-star ranks. You've gotten guys to not go to Alabama, not go to Ohio State, not go to these top programs, and you've gotten guys to come to Michigan. But when they come here, they do not live up to the talent that they have. Mm -hmm. And the coaching and development just hasn't been up to par. And this is not what Michigan fans expected going into year six, but that's where we're at. Yep. Can't win big games on the road. Got absolutely smacked at Wisconsin in the 2019-2020 season last time they went. Wisconsin was up 35 nothing going into halftime. It was just a complete embarrassment. Mm-hmm. You beat MSU one year, you can't beat them the next. I mean, they, they get punched in the mouth and they just fall apart. They lack confidence. They lack heart. They they just they they lack mental toughness. Then you add on that Jim Harbaugh likes to selectively pick the guys that he loves, and will pick those guys over more talented options on the bench. But nobody, most fans don't know the talent that's there, mm-hmm. because he just sticks with the guys that are there. Like he started a walk on linebacker for most of the season last year, that wasn't very effective, but he was tough according to Jim Harbaugh. So he just started him. Josh Ross is a middle linebacker, but you play him at outside linebacker. He's completely ineffective there. Don Brown sticks to the stubborn blitz defense and just leaves DBs that aren't fit for the system he's running, just leaves them out on the island, and they get cooked every every week. Mm-hmm. It, it was just bad. It was just bad. From a team that, you know, especially like last year, had Quiddy Pay, um, Who looks like he's about to be a stud for the Colts. <laughs> we've had – I mean, Michigan's had – Guys like Devin Bush come into the NFL and just play really great. But as a unit, 
this defense has not really done anything, at least in the last couple of years. It hasn't been complete since 2016. Yeah. That was the year when everything just fit together and made sense. Yeah, and that's where a lot of people thought that this Michigan team was going to be flourishing was in the defensive side of the ball. And they did for a short bit. But they were, what, like the third worst defensive team in the Big Ten last year? Don Brown got too stubborn. It wasn't going to change anything. Yeah. And that's where you really saw it in the Michigan Michigan State game last year. Go deep. And it that's, was, that is all. It was so all it was. sad. Listen, Michigan State had a true freshman receiver, Ricky White, mm-hmm. from Georgia. I believe he had like eight catches for 160 something yards and two touchdowns in that game. Yeah. His, he did. His averages from last year, which I'll bring up later 10 catches. For 223 yards. He didn't have another game like that the rest of the season. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why do you think he didn't have a game close to that again the rest of the season? Hmm. The the defenses probably didn't let him get over the top. Don Brown just let it happen. Jim Harbaugh Harbaugh just watched it and just refused to adjust anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping things can change somewhat. This year, like I said, first year defensive coordinator, so it's not going to be. It, I'll hope it's great from the jump, but odds are it's not going to be. There's going to be transition. There's clear talent on the defense. Daxton Hill chose Michigan over Alabama. He should be one of the best safeties in the country without a doubt, and he has the talent. Mm-hmm. But the way they've used him, it just hasn't shown up. He's shown signs every single season in every game, but he just doesn't stand out like he should. Yeah. And it, he is that level of a player. If he went to Alabama, we would be seeing the level of player he is. Mm-hmm. Daxton Hill is there. The corners were a problem last year. It was mainly Vincent Gray, who he's not a starter anymore. <laughs> DJ Turner took his spot. Guy from Georgia that has a ton of talent, sophomore. Jamon Green is back. He was on and off last season, but was clearly the best corner. He's the other starter. They have talent in the secondary. They have talent at linebackers. It's a mix of youth and experience, but they have talent. Josh Ross is back at middle linebacker where he's supposed to be. Nikhail Hill-Green is a guy that's a sophomore that's jumped onto the scene, taking all the reps at linebacker, and just he's supposed to emerge this season. Aiden Hutchinson, one of the best defensive ends in the country. They got him in a new scheme where he's going to be standing up and down in a three-point stands in different situations. Mm -hmm. They've got so much talent. On defense and on offense. You got Cade McNamara starting at quarterback after the Joe Milton experience fell through. You got Hassan Haskins back, Blake Corn back as a sophomore, and Donovan Edwards, who was one of the best running backs in the country, he's back. Mm -hmm. He chose Michigan over Alabama and Notre Dame. And I saw him live and in person. He's the real deal. Real deal. Played uh, Lake Orion last year. The burst is real. He's sneaky strong. And he's elusive. And he has good vision. Mm Mm-hmm. Then you have returning experience at the receiver position. Ronnie Bell, who I think is one of the most underrated receivers in the country. Showed out in a few games If last he year. was at another school, I'm going to... He could make a name for himself. I'm going to save this for the Ohio State thing, but I think he's just as good as a certain receiver that's getting a lot of hype from Ohio State. He just doesn't have the offense or the right people coaches everything around him to be at that level. Yeah. Ronnie Bell is the real deal at a, as a possession receiver. I was going to say, he became Michigan's go-to guy when they needed a big play. Exactly. They've got him. They've got returning guys that are very elusive and very fast and very exciting, but we haven't seen much of it yet. Roman Wilson started as a freshman last year. He showed signs, but, but it wasn't consistent enough. A.J. Henning, a guy that was a high four-star guy a few years ago out of Illinois, He's another guy that should burst out. Cornelius Johnson should be a high-level number one guy. And then you've got Dalen Baldwin, who transferred from Jackson State and chose Michigan over Ohio State. So you've got that. you got good tight ends. you got a reshuffled O-line, but it's very talented. Mm-hmm. The talent is there. That, that's the main thing. The talent it will not be the problem. And I've heard some people, including somebody I know very closely, that believes that talent is the problem, and it's, and that's one of the main things, but that's just not it. Mm-hmm. They've recruited guys that could have gone to the other top schools in the country, but at those other schools, they would be used properly, and they would be putting up stats that reflect their talent. 
Yeah. But when they come to Michigan, their talent is almost dampened and just they they don't get the chance. They don't look the way they would they would look at other places. Yeah. And that that's just the problem. Coaching and development has been a problem year after year. And this year I think they actually start out strong because the the schedule isn't crazy. Western Michigan, that's a win. Jim Harbaugh always blows out who he's supposed to blow out. That's the thing. Yeah. And when good teams come to Michigan, he usually figures out a way to dominate those teams too or pull out wins. Mm-hmm. But it's the tough games on the road and the games against the higher, the most talented and most well-coached teams in the country. He just can't, he can't hack it. Yeah. And if that doesn't change this year, there's no way he comes back. I believe this is an eight and four team because all the things that are changing in terms of coaching, but the talent is still there for them to win eight to nine games. I think they start six and two, including a win against Washington at home, which that will hype up Michigan fans because those are the type of wins that get Michigan fans hyped up. Yeah. I'm, I, I hope that at this point, most Michigan fans will say, okay, good win. Now keep it going. Mm-hmm. But I think they start out six and two. The game at Wisconsin on Oct- on October second is going to be the what tells the story of the season to me. Yeah. Two years ago, you get slaughtered at Wisconsin, thirty five nothing mm-hmm. at halftime. If they go to Wisconsin and they put up a fight, and they punch back after getting punched, and it's not an embarrassing loss, I hope they pull out the win. But it's most likely it's going to be a loss. If it's a close loss, if it's like a 28-24 game, fine. Yeah. That shows improvement. But you cannot go to Wisconsin and get destroyed again. Mm-hmm. It cannot happen. Can't be a 42 to 14 game. Can't be something that where they look like they're lost and and have no confidence and they're mentally weak once again. Mm-hmm. 6 and 2 start in my opinion. Then last four weeks, Indiana at Penn State at Maryland, Ohio State. I think it's most likely a one and three stretch. That will determine where the season goes. I predict eight and four. Anything less than eight wins, Jim Harbaugh has to go, in my opinion. So this is it. This is your year. Yeah. I, I believe they're, if they're an eight and four team and they show improvement of not getting blown out by the teams they're supposed to be in games with, you're not supposed to get blown out by Wisconsin like they did two years ago. It's just not supposed to happen. You stay in these games. They could beat Indy. It's at home. They could beat Indiana at home. Mm-hmm. Going to Penn State, they came back and almost got back into it last game, but they started out slow and were getting beat in the first half really bad. Yeah. Put up a good fight against Penn State. Maryland is looking to take a next step this year. Go to Maryland and put them away. Don't get slaughtered by Ohio State. It's about the improvements. Eight wins, not getting slaughtered by every team. If you get embarrassed one in one game, like if you get smacked by Ohio State, because Ohio State is going to be one of the top three three teams in the country this year. Yeah. There's not much they can do about that when I think they're going to be an eight and four team. Mm-hmm. But you can't get blown out by Wisconsin. You can't lose at Michigan State. You can't get blown out at Penn State. Mm-hmm. And losing at Maryland would almost be the death nail to me. I predict eight and four. I expect to see improvements. The talent is there. Let's see if the coaching lives up to it. That's all I got. Wow. Okay. Optimism. <laughs> optimism. Eight and four. Eight and four optimism. They are more than capable of going eight and four. And eight and four still would give you Jim Harbaugh back? If they go eight and four and they're in almost every game. The Ohio State game, most people have – Realize that game is it's going to take a long time to get to where Ohio State is. Right. Can't get smacked by Wisconsin. Can't, be, can't get smacked by Penn State. You need to beat Maryland at Maryland, yeah. even though they've improved. It's not a talent problem. You have several players that could be All-American status and a few freaks of nature. Aiden Hutchinson, Daxton Hill, and a few guys on offense. No excuses. All righty. No excuses. Oh, boy. Now. Now to the Spartans. To the real exciting part of it. We've got Joey. 
I mean, with okay. the MSU preview. So the Spartans are all are actually interesting. This is Mel Tucker's first year. Yeah. Um, last year was such a crazy whirlwind to be thrown into, especially the way that he was thrown into. So this is basically his, his first go around. So he gets some slack, but we are going to tighten the slack a little bit. It's not like completely last year where it's just like, whatever happens, happens. You beat Michigan last year. It's, it's great. You know, you finished two and five. Okay. You found two wins when a team, this team, there was a chance they could have not gotten any. Um, Mel Tucker and his staff, he's got Jay Johnson that he brought over from Colorado, uh, as his offensive coordinator. Can I I just mention real quick, the, the Colorado situation, I think Mel Tucker could leave Michigan state within like four or five years because his track record of jumping from place to place is pretty frequent right now. Like he, he promised recruits and recruits parents and like the state of Colorado, I'll be back. Yeah. And then the Michigan State job came and he was like, well, I'm jumping to Michigan State. Mm -hmm. Just kind of a best case scenario guy. We'll say that right now. Yeah. Um, And then he also brought in Scotty Hazleton, who has a lot of experience being a defensive coordinator. He was a linebackers coach for the Jaguars back in the day. Uh, So he definitely has a lot of experience. But this is again, this is kind of those guys full season to get this right. Now, this team has a quarterback dilemma. It's not a terrible one. It's a very average one. But Mel Tucker will not tell you who's going to start the quarterback week one against Northwestern. Supposedly, it's supposed to be a play on getting an advantage, I guess. But between Anthony Russo, Temple transfer, and Peyton Thorne, who we saw last year in a couple games, had one good game against Penn State, threw for three touchdowns and one interception. The other game threw some interceptions. He's been on the MSU roster. He's, you know, he's been around these guys a little bit longer. Anthony Russo, a lot of people have high hopes for him, but he is another one of those guys that he can push the ball downfield, but he throws a good amount of interceptions. So it's it, it's hard to say. We were talking before the show. We kind of lean on the side of Peyton Thorne getting the starting role. But it's hard to say when you get a guy like Anthony Russo who has so much more experience um, in these games and you brought him in that maybe he gets the starting nod. But I honestly, I could see this going back and forth where they – it depends. Like one guy could start and then a couple games in, the other guy could come in, which I hate seeing because MSU has been doing that for the last forever, it feels like. Do you feel more confident with this situation than just the individual Rocky Lombardi situation? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just had to get that opinion. Yeah. To be fair, I was totally, I just didn't like Rocky Lombardi. Rocky's at Northern Illinois now. I hope he does well in the Mac. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I had ho- strong hopes for Rocky early on, but. <laughs> he had a big arm and that was about it. <laughs> yeah. Had a big arm. Yeah. So. We'll have to wait and see. Peyton Thorne does have a little bit of mobility to him, um, but neither guy is like going to completely change the pace of the game necessarily. So we'll just have to wait and see on the quarterback situation. Running backs, though. This is where MSU, I think, has not completely bread and butter, but they've got a good running back committee that they can use. They've got weapons on offense. Yes. So they bring back guys, Elijah Collins, Connor Hayward, Jordan Simmons. We've seen those guys. Connor Hayward feels like he's been there for 10 years. He said he was going to transfer, then came back. Yeah. Uh, He's shown some bright spots early on. Last couple years, he's struggled. Elijah Collins had a good uh, 2019, but then last year, not as great. Obviously, it was a weird year, but their offensive line stunk. Um, Jordan Simmons had a couple, you know, all right games. The big ones, though, they got Harold Joyner from Auburn. Let me read this to you. He's six foot four, two hundred and thirty pounds. Huge. So huge. I I mean the only unfortunately the only comparison I can make is Derrick Henry. He's not just Derek just Henry. size, just yes, size, yeah. just in size. Don't don't take yeah. that out of proportion. He's a heck. He's a heck of an athlete too, but he's never put it all together at the running back position. Yes, that's the thing. They also got a transfer from Wake Forest, 
Kenneth Walker III. Now, he is the promising one. A thousand-yard rusher from Wake Forest. So I hope that he can pair with somebody else on this team. Him and one of these other running backs, because they're all kind of big-bodied running backs that just like to ground and pound for the most part. Jordan Simmons is the one that's like more elusive, but yeah, right. he has some strength to him. Yeah. Um, but I'm hoping... I would love it if Harold Joyner can figure it out though, because to be able to just, just yeah to use him to rumble in if they need to would be fantastic. When you get inside the twenty, just throw him in there. Yes, <laughs> just just throw him in. So two big transfers for Michigan State at the running back position, which I already feel like, like I said, their their running back depth is solid. They all have experience. So if the offensive line can figure this out. Michigan State can get back to their ground and pound type of offense. And I think that's the way Mel Tucker would want to play because he's a defensive coach. So he wants to just pound the other team's defense, and then he wants to rely on his defense to slow the other team down and just play a very slow-paced game. That's my opinion. But now the problem with that is Michigan State has some stud receivers on this team. And they brought in more transfers, too. They, yeah. they really they got yeah. some depth. So they have a lot of depth. The three guys I'm going to point out, though. From guys the, that could be studs. Yeah. The guys from last year, Jalen Naylor, Jaden Reed, Ricky That's a good White. One. That's a good one, two, three. Yeah. So those top three, like we said, Ricky White, his stats are a little <laughs> inflated from the Michigan game. But there's no doubt he was a freshman last year, so he can only go up from there, you'd hope. They're all, like, real big play guys. Jalen Naylor going to be an NFL prospect. Jaden Reed, NFL prospect, I can assume. Ricky White, like I said, it's his second season, could be very good. So if they can figure out that quarterback situation, we'll see. There are a lot of big pl- – they're, like, they're big play receivers, so they're going to go deep downfield and make a, make a play on the ball. So that's the only – that's the part, too, where I feel like Anthony Russo might get that job because he does have – maybe the slightly bigger arm or that's what he's known for to push that ball when they need to. Um, and so that's going to be where Michigan's offense is going to Michigan state's offense is going to be really interesting because they could do a very pro style offense where they run the ball, try to ground and pound and then hit you with a play action, big play to one of these bigger, big, nice receivers. And, and maybe they'll figure something out. Um, so there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of talent on this offense and the offensive line hopefully should be better. Um, but that's kind of where they're at. If the offensive line can figure this out, I think this offense has a really good chance to do something. Uh, the one thing that's kind of weird is their tight end situation. So they lost Josiah Price to the NFL. He was one of their best tight ends. So now they have this like ragtag crew of tight ends um Trenton Gillison he's a redshirt junior came out of Ohio in 2018 he's been all right he but, showed signs of being really good but he's, yeah yeah and he might figure it out this year he reminds me of Nick Eubanks that Michigan had he, yeah. he made a big play every few games but he was never consistent yeah so people are hoping that he can figure it out but then you got Tyler Hunt he's a redshirt senior former <laughs> former punter at one point one of the weirdest yeah. position changes. Um, Must be a hell of an athlete. But, you know, he, he came in all right last year, did a couple things, a couple trick plays. All right. Cameron Allen's a freshman. A lot of people think uh, he could show out and do something. Um, I mean, there's been some some hype around him and their spring practices and things like that. Uh, they got another redshirt freshman, Malik Carr. I mean... He's, He's from Oak Park. Yeah. Came in from Purdue. And then another weird one, Adam Berghorst. He's a junior. He he pitches for the MSU baseball team, but he's 6'7", 260 pounds. People are looking. So, like, he could be utilized in a lot of different ways of just, you know, like blocking and things like that. So, their tight end situation, where normally – Michigan State tight end situations, they usually have, like, a really good tight end for a while. They've been known for that. Now they just have this, like, ragtag crew. You should hope that Malik Carr is the one that sets himself apart because he is a mm-hmm. real athlete. 
Yeah. I saw him play for the family a few years ago when he mm-hmm. was playing AU basketball. And he was really good. He had offers in basketball and football. Yeah. And when he went to Purdue, it was because he was going to play both, but it didn't work out there. So, yeah. Yeah, he's 6'6", 240-something almost, 230. Four-star recruit. Yeah. Um, He was... He was number four in That's why. He was a He was a receiver going into Purdue, yeah. and they made him like a tight end receiver hybrid, which yeah. they, Mel Tucker might do with him too. So yeah. he could be somewhat of an X factor. Yeah. Because he's by far the most athletic of the group. Right. So they, they got some talent there, but it's, again, it's another one of those things where there's a lot of question marks. Hard to figure out exactly what they're going to do there, but they got a lot of gif- different guys that they could give you a lot of different looks from their tight end position that can do a lot of different things. Which... Yeah, it's still a work in progress overall because they're they're trying to mix in the transfers with the guys they have, right? And just trying to make it fit all together. Yep. Plus figuring out the quarterback situation. Yeah. Now we get to the defense, and the defense is also weird, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, like I said before, Mel Tucker is known as a defensive coach. That's what. He prides himself on their defense last year as, as yards per game goes was pretty solid. They allowed under 400 yards a game. Not great, not terrible, but the problem was they were dead last in scoring defense, giving up 35 points per game. So that's, (laughs) that's not great. Um, they lost some of their top guys. They lost their leading tackler, Antoine Simmons. Um, they lost Shakur Brown. He led the nation in interceptions. Yeah, he had five interceptions, more than the team had as a whole. (laughs) Um, they're, they have some linebackers that, you know, have some upside. Noah Harvey, Chase Klein. They might be the most, like you said, they might have the most upside of the defense. Yeah. Because, yeah, he's he's recruited some guys and brought in some transfers. Yeah, they're both 6'4", 235 pounds. Yeah. I don't know. It's definitely like the defense has got to come from the front four. Um, they do have super senior Drew Beasley. Uh, they did get a transfer from Duke, Drew Jordan. He's going to look for a starting spot. Um, Jacob Panasiuk is coming back. He had five sacks in 2019. Um, I don't know. Like Again, they got some big guys up front. They could do something, but there's just there's just a lot of question marks for this defensive team. Another, it's similar to Michigan, where Michigan State has been known for having a defense. They've gotten really good defensive talent come out into the NFL, and now they're just kind of stuck. Where with this rebuild, their defense is subpar. They brought in a lot of guys for the secondary. They brought four corners in: Kerry Crump from Arizona, Chester Kimbrough from Florida. Marky Lowry from Louisville, and Ronald Williams from Alabama. Um, they do have Angelo Gross for safety. And then Xavier Henderson, who might be their best in the secondary, uh, finished with 41 tackles yeah, last sec- year. The second, If that transfer from Alabama hits, the secondary might be the best part of the defense. Linebackers might have the most upside, but the secondary might be the best and most consistent. Yeah. And that's again, that's you know, that's something that we've kind of seen from Michigan State over the last so many years. So for me, again, there's not a ton there's not a ton to like Friday night in Northwestern is a tough start. That is a big game yeah. for their season, I think. Because if they can figure out how to knock off Northwestern on Friday night, then they could make Noise as a rebuild team, as weird as that sounds. Um, after Northwestern, they have Youngstown State. Should be a win. I hope so. Then they're going to be at Miami. That's a loss. Nebraska, looking like that could be a win. Yeah. Western Kentucky. Could be a challenge. Could be. They're going to air it out. Hoping for a win. Rutgers. Challenge. Could be tough. It's at Rutgers. At Indiana, probably a loss. Playing Michigan. You never know. You never know. It could be a win. It could be a loss. And they're at Purdue. Should be a win, I'm hoping. It, it, it depends on what Purdue looks like by that time of the season. It yeah. depends. 
Um, then they got to play Maryland at home. Really tough game. That's going to be tough. And then their last two games of the season are losses. They're at Ohio. <laughs> they're at Ohio State, and they get uh, home against Penn State. If they that Penn State game, Michigan State has pulled off magic before. It was under D'Antoni. Yes, but they've pulled off magic before. That Penn State game. Who knows where both of those teams will be at that point? Yeah, that could be up in the air. Mm-hmm. Could this team make a bowl game, Joey? I think it's possible. So, so what I'm hoping for. Oh, it takes a six wins, and that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, that's that's kind of what my projection has been for this season: six wins, get to 500. Like, okay, yeah, you were two and five last year, so you would think they're going to be just as bad this year. But I think they have a lot of talent. There is a lot of question marks, but their schedule is pretty favorable for the most part. If the, again, I think a big part of their season hinges on this Northwestern game. Because if they lose to Northwestern, it could make some of these other matchups down the line. That could be a one and two start. Tough. Exactly. Exactly. So one and two going into Nebraska, whereas people hope are thinking that Nebraska will at some point figure something out. We'll get to that, but there's, not, a, there's a good chance they could win their next two games. Nebraska, they could get a little bit of confidence going. Right. So Michigan State, I think under the lights on ESPN, a Northwestern win would be big because it's at Northwestern too. Um, and that'll give a good start to Michigan State's season. Other than that, their schedule could get them to six wins. And I'm hopeful for it. But I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I... Because, I don't know. Like we said, they, especially like their offense. Their offense has a lot of talent. It's the defense that you hope that Mel Tucker and uh, Scotty Hazleton can figure it out with what they have on the defense to slow teams down. Because I think they're going to be a lot better at scoring the ball this year. And that was kind of a struggle last year. I don't know. Give me a prediction right now. Friday night. Friday night at Northwestern. Northwestern. We'll get to Northwestern, but they're they're replacing most of their t- team. But yeah. Pat Fitzgerald always gets the best out of them. Yep, they've that had game their, at Northwestern. What five of their last six seasons have been winning seasons? Yeah. So they, they've figured it out. They're not in a rebuild like Michigan State. I'm gonna say Michigan State gets it done. That's hopeful thinking. But I, I, I want, I want Michigan State to be good sooner rather than later, to start showing signs. So I'm gonna say they they get a win, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure I can watch that game. And I hope they stay in this rebuild stage for as long as possible. Oh my gosh, Molly! I need listen, man. Come on, listen. I need something to look forward to. Okay, I I just need something, just something. Just a little bit to something. And then being in a rebuild is something to look forward to? For me. Come on. <laughs> they beat I'm Michigan the last fan. year with nobodies. You're right. <laughs> and it was, an, it, it was a complete embarrassment. <laughs> complete embarrassment. I didn't even know what I was watching. But it didn't reflect the rest of the season. That was just a, a one-time Michigan thing. It was. It was, yes. a, it was a rivalry game, but still. Yeah, it was a, it was a Michigan thing. Well, so we'll have to see. We'll have to see. But there's big ones out of the way. There's ways. Next, we got to go to the real big one in the conference, which uh, we all hate to talk about. <laughs> isn't exciting for us, but is exciting for Ohio State fans. Yeah. The Buckeyes are back. Top three again. Surprise, surprise. Hey, they got, they got talent overloaded everywhere. I mean. They just lost their starting quarterback, their starting running back. They lost one of their best receivers, and they're right back where they started. Listen, they're they're Alabama Clemson mode where you 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 reload. There's no restarting. Yeah, they're just reloading constantly. This year's quarterback C.J. Stroud, kid from California, redshirt freshman, ton of talent, finished as a top five quarterback in his class a few years ago. Yep, which makes things interesting because he has three guys behind him who all want to play and are all good enough to play. So there may be a transfer soon. But you got C.J. Stroud. You got Master Teague back. 
as the most experienced and toughest back, but he's not the most talented back on the roster. You got a true freshman in, number one back in the country named Travion Henderson from Virginia. There are people that are saying he could almost be in Heisman conversations by the end of the season because he's just that good. Go figure. Yeah, every, everybody coming out of Ohio State camps and all analysts all over the country are saying he's going to be the best running back on that roster. Mm-hmm. But Master Teague is going to get the boatload of the carries to start. Yeah. I mean, Teague ended up with more touchdowns than Trey Sermon. So Yeah. He, he's the reliable. He's not going to fumble. He's going to find the hole. And he's not very elusive, but he's, he's going to break tackles, and he's just going to get those yards. Yeah. Now here's, here's where we get to the little co- controversial part. Receivers, their receiving core is deeper than almost any receiving core in the country. Mm-hmm. Outside of like Clemson, it's it's filled with youth and a, a little bit of, of experience. But all the youth they have, they're all ready to play. Yeah, they're all ready to play. But the starting one and two, Garrett Wilson, who I think is the best receiver on that team and a freak of nature, and a future first round pick. Garrett Wilson is just a beast. He's only like six foot, like one eighty something, mm-hmm. but he can go up and get it. He's super fast. He's a great route runner. He has it all. Chris Olave is a dependable, high-level number two receiver. But in my opinion, him and Ronnie Bell are the same thing. Okay, so that's what your comparison. I was thinking that might have been your comparison. Yes. Because they're both kind of like... they like are. You would more consider both of those guys slot guys, but they go out wide. Yes, they they can move all over the place. They're both dependable, more possession type receivers that can make big plays down downfield, but they're more dependent to just keep the chains moving and keep getting first downs. Yeah. Ronnie Bell is just as good as him after the catch. I don't see much of a difference besides who the quarterback is in the in the systems they play in, but that's just me. I don't see why everybody's hyping up Chris Olave so much. Like I said, he's dependable. High level, number two guy. He's going to catch it. He's going to get open. He's going to make plays. That's great. But everybody's saying he could. he's the best receiver in the country, potential Heisman candidate, a guy that could be a first-round receiver. I don't see all that. I, I don't, see that. don't see Heisman. This is, the hype around Chris Olave is a lot, in my opinion. I it's could maybe see first-round pick. Maybe. If he puts up those stats this year and proves me wrong, it is what it is. Yeah. But up to this point, I don't see much difference. I saw a stat yesterday. Chris Olave is the present leader in receiving yards in the Big Ten. Ronnie Bell is fifth. Mm. There's one difference between those slots. Who's throwing it to you and the yeah. system you're in. That mm-hmm. is the one difference. Yeah. Ronnie Bell has had four or five different quarterbacks thrown to him. Never adjusted to one set system but he still makes plays no matter what. Right. When he when it's when he's targeted. Mm-hmm. But let's get past that. I mean they're they're loaded everywhere. Where do you really need to point at one place? No. I mean, you got Jack Sawyer coming in, true freshman defensive end out of Ohio. Everybody's saying he could be just as good as the Bosa brothers or better. <laughs> he's already looking like a monster. Mm-hmm. It just it goes on and on. There's depth and talent everywhere. They're a playoff team. Yeah. What what more what more is there to say about this team? Right. They'll be there. We'll I see mean, them. this this game against Minnesota Friday night is going to be very interesting. Away game to start in the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's Ohio State. Should we just move on? They're uh, they're they're that good. Yeah, and their schedule is actually not hard at all. They play Oregon week two, who's ranked eleventh. That's the big challenge. Then they play But like, it's at home. In the middle of or the end of October, they're at Indiana. I guess that's their other toughest game. Yeah. Then they play Penn State. But by the time they get to Penn State, James Franklin has beaten them once. Yeah. Is it's at Ohio State? Is it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Penn State's at home. Penn State ain't winning that. That's game. why I said Indiana might be their toughest game because it's at Indiana. Sorry, Penn State. Sean Clifford is not going into Ohio State and winning that one. Yeah. And it or- might be close for a little bit, but. Oregon has to come into Ohio, so, yeah. Yeah, their hardest game is at Indiana. One loss at the most, probably not even one loss. Yeah. Playoff team. Exactly. They're the juggernaut of the Big Ten, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. 
it would be great if somebody could catch up eventually, but they're they're where they are. Yeah. It's gonna <sighs> take a while. Damn Ohio State Buckeyes. Moving on. It's more Michigan and Michigan State, to be honest, because they're the ones that are always supposed to be the contenders. I mean, Mich- Michigan State, under D'Antoni, they weren't known for being the most talented. They were known for being the most well-coached and most well-developed. Right. That's the thing. But I'm just saying. Every could, few years, they could knock off Ohio State because they were just well, that's what I'm saying. a they, better team at that time. They made it to be able to compete. Yes. So Yeah, Michigan is just a problem. We're not going to get to that. We're not going to get to that. We've passed Michigan. On to Penn State. Okay. James Franklin is back. Once again, I think he might leave for a bigger job soon, but that's for a conversation for another time. Mm-hmm. Possibly USC when they fire Clay Helton eventually. Please fire Clay Helton. Sean Clifford back another year, fourth year. Doesn't inspire much confidence in Penn State fans. Yeah, I he's, mean, he's, he's, a, he's a decent quarterback. He is a just, I guess, just good, yeah. just good. But when you need to pull out those bigger games, he's not going to raise the level of the team. Right. He's a reliable guy that's not going to turn it over a lot. He His turnovers went up last year, which was a reason why a lot of people wanted them to move in a different di- direction. But mm-hmm. he's reliable for the most part. And you know what you get out of Sean Clifford. Yeah. You know what you get. Just solid, reliable quarterback. Running back room is just deep. Very, very talented. Usual Penn State always has t- top flight. Yeah. Running backs, but they're mostly going to rely on Noah Kane and Trey and Kevon Lee, both two. I don't know if they're classified as freshmen or sophomores at this point. I think they both came in last year. I guess technically freshmen still, but they're they're both they play two different styles and they're both really good running backs. Mm-hmm. Bringing back Jahan Dotson, who's one of the best receivers in the country, and Parker Washington, who was a freshman last year, really good one-two punch. Got to find who the consistent number three will be after that, but. I think they'll find it. Mm-hmm. Tight ends, they are. They always have an NFL tight end or two ready to go. They got one guy, Brenton Strange, and another guy who I think is the breakout my guy, uh, Theo Johnson, who chose Penn State over Michigan. I remember it, and it still hurts my feelings. <laughs> six six two forty, just a ridiculous athlete out of Canada. He can do it all at the tight end position. And they're going to need him to replace Pat Fryermuth. Yes. They have him and Strange. So, one of them will emerge, right. most definitely. Mm-hmm. And then they have elite athletes at every position on defense, pretty much. They're reshuffling the D-line and have a few transfers, but they still have playmakers. Defense, I mean, they just they got monsters. Brandon Smith, at linebacker, is an athletic freak. Yeah, Penn State, in the recent years, has been known for getting yes. great defensive talent. They're, they're li- they've been known as linebacker U for a long time, and that's not going to slow down. Micah Parsons up in the draft for a reason. Micah Parsons is going to be a star for the Cowboys. Brandon Smith isn't as fast as Micah Parsons, but he's even more physical. Mm-hmm. I mean, just if you get the chance, go watch Brandon Smith high school highlights, and he is just smacking regular high school kids. He's it's, It doesn't look fair. Mm-hmm. He's just putting them in the dirt, and he should do more of that in the Big Ten. Plus, they have depth at DB. Joey Porter Jr., yeah, we're getting, Could be, yeah, we're getting to that stage where we're, we're getting seeing there. Suns coming in. Could be all Big Ten. He has size and overall talent. And true freshman Lamont Wade, who's from Michigan, another guy that left Michigan to go to Penn State. They've got another pipeline going from Michigan, which is disheartening, but that's <laughs> they've gotten it going. Kid from Cass Tech, I believe. Either King or Cass Tech. They said he's looking like the best young corner they've had in that program since Jane Franklin got there. <laughs> he might be a starter from the jump. They got a lot of talent. But they've been known to drop games they shouldn't drop. Yep. And they got Penn, they got Auburn coming to town week two. Well, they got week one against Wisconsin. Yeah, that's that's the start. So <laughs> going to Wisconsin week one, forgot to mention that. Yeah. That's the start, which is a tough game from the jump. They mm-hmm. could win, but I think Wisconsin might pull out a, a slow, tough one. I don't think it's gonna be a high flying game. Yeah. Ball State week two should be a win. Auburn is kind of resetting slash mm-hmm. rebuilding week three, so that should be a win too. Indiana, they got them at home. They could win that one. Going to Iowa, that might be a loss because that I've seen them lose at Iowa several say, times. Anytime you got to go to Iowa, is, that's tough. Yeah. This stretch at Ohio State, at Maryland, against Michigan, Rutgers won't be a pushover like they used to be. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, going to Michigan State, like I said, 
We don't know where either team will be. Yeah. They have the, the talent to be a 9 or 10 win team, but they could disappoint. Yeah. They really could. James Franklin hasn't shown that he, he can pull out those games consistently that need to be pulled out to win the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. So they have a lot of talent, like Penn State usually does, but 9, 10 wins, usually where they're around, I see more 9 and 3 than yeah. 10. Now we only got so, 10 minutes left, so we got to start hustling hurrying it through. Up. Indiana, bringing back Michael Penix, Tom Allen back as coach, Stephen Carr in from USC at running back, Ty Fry Fogel back at receiver. They're constantly building this program. They might take a slight step back from where they were last year, but they're still going to be a good team. I think they're between seven and eight wins. As long as Michael Penix can stay healthy. If Michael Penix can stay healthy and hit his talent level that Indiana fans want to see, they'll still be a good team. Indiana will keep improving. Yes. Maryland. Mike Loxley back for his third year, I believe. He's done a great job recruiting, but I still don't know how good of a coach he actually is. They made progress last year with Talia Tunga-Vailoa. Tunga. Tunga-Vailoa. Trying to pronounce it as well as I can. At quarterback, not as big as Tua, but he has just as much arm talent. He makes some mistakes, needs to clean those up, but he has all the talent to be their quarterback. Mm-hmm. Rakeem Jarrett picked Maryland. He decided to stay home over Alabama and all the top schools in the country last year. He shined as a freshman, and he should shine even more as a sophomore. They're still building. Some people think this could be somewhat of a breakout season for them, but I still think they're only a six- or seven-win team. They could pull off an upset against somebody, but maybe Penn, maybe Penn State, maybe Michigan, they could pull out one of those. Yeah. But I still think they're a six- or seven-win team, a bowl team. That's progress for Maryland. And they got to replace Jake Funk, who's in the NFL. Yep. Got a deep running back room, though, so they should yeah. be fine. Lastly, Rutgers. They're rebuilding. They showed tons of progress with Greg Schiano back last year. He was their coach in their best years of their program. The, the recruiting class they have coming in next year is the best almost in, in school history. So Greg Schiano was getting things back where they want to be at Rutgers. Still might only be a four, five, six win team, but progress is happening at Rutgers. Don't sleep on them. They're not pushovers. On to the West. Wisconsin, Graham Mertz, highest-rated quarterback in school history, five-star kid, showed signs last year but was inconsistent. Mm -hmm. They're looking for him to take the next step this year. Still replacing the running back for the Colts, the guy that I wasn't sure if he was going to be a really good NFL running back, and he already has proven me wrong. (laughs) One of the top fantasy running backs probably for a lot of people this year. Mm -hmm. Still working on replacing him. Got a transfer in from Clemson named Chez Malusi. Heck of a name, Mm -hmm. Chez. And Jalen Berger, who was a highly ranked kid out of New Jersey. It'll be a two-back system. Hopefully, they'll they'll probably look to establish one of them as the go-to guy, but they'll play both of them throughout the season. Still nothing crazy in the receiving core. A few playmakers. Nothing out of the the ordinary. Mm -hmm. O-line will always be great. It's a Wisconsin staple. It's what they do. Yeah. O-line always great. They got a few really good linebackers that could be all-conference, potentially all-American-level guys. Strong strong D-line, but no real standouts. And a surprisingly talented um, secondary. Yeah, really good safeties. Yeah, Scott Nelson could be an all-Big Ten-level guy, and they have some good corners. Wisconsin should be a 10-win team, honestly. Mm-hmm. Should make it to the Big Ten championship again. Whether they challenge Ohio State or not, who knows? Right. Probably won't. Graham Mertz would have to have a big step up. Exactly. Northwestern, Pat Fitzgerald, back as coach again, one of the best coaches in the country. They're replacing – they're one of the teams in the country that's replacing more than any other team. Mm-hmm. I think it's like 70-something percent of their production is being replaced. Yeah. And that includes quarterback who – Played really well. They're starting Hunter Johnson, who came in a few years ago from Clemson. Got the starting job two years ago, stunk it up, <laughs> got hurt, lost the job, was the backup last year. They brought in Ryan Helinski from South Carolina. Everybody assumed he was going to be the starter. Pat Fitzgerald named Hunter Johnson the starter, which had a lot of Northwestern fans and analysts kind of confused. Some people think it's going to be a down year for them, like it was a few years ago mm-hmm. where they went 3-9. and nine. But Pat Fitzgerald gave him the starting job for a reason. Right. 
He was a five-star guy going to Clemson. Didn't work out there. Came to Northwestern. Very shaky start. But if Pat believes in him and he built his confidence back up and got the starting job, I believe in Pat Fitzgerald, so I believe he could be a solid enough quarterback yeah. for them to win six or seven games. Now, they're starting running back Cam Porter, who was a freshman last year, is out for the season towards ACL. They still have a guy, Evan Hull, who's very tough, mm-hmm. and a transfer from Bowling Green named Andrew Clare, who's also tough. But I don't think they're going to be high level. They'll just get those tough yards, not many high-level plays. Yeah, it's, so it's similar almost to Michigan State where they, they do have depth at the running back, and they can throw different guys out there, but nobody that stands out. Yeah, no. Their receiving core is going to be – I don't think people realize how how good they've done recruiting their receiving core the last few seasons. They got a not guy named Bryce Kurtz who was almost a four-star receiver out of Indiana, I believe, a few day, a few years ago. Jensen Hooper-Price, 6'4", big-bodied receiver, 6'4", like 210. They have receiving options, and they have a good tight end coming back. Now, defense, they're replacing a lot. But they still have experience. Mm-hmm. They're always experienced. They'll always have juniors and seniors on defense, but they're replacing most of their starters. Because Pat Fitzgerald is more of a defensive coach, I believe they will still be at least at least an average middle-of-the-road defense. Yeah, I don't see them completely falling off. He's going to get the most out of those guys. Northwestern could have a fall-off season, a bit of a re- reset, maybe four wins, but I think they could still – get six to seven just because they have the coaching factor on their side. Right. Like we said, winning season last uh, five of the last six seasons. So Yeah. Iowa. Their talent is improving year by year. They've had the same coach for a very long time, but their recruiting has improved. Tyler Goodson is one of the best running backs in the Big Ten. His name is going to get on the NFL radar very soon. Mm-hmm. He's short, but he's stocky, and he's also elusive, and he's very tough. He's going to make a lot of plays for them. They always run the ball a lot, so he's going to get a lot of yards, probably over 1,000. Tight ends, they've always got them. Yep. Always put somebody in the NFL. They still have them. Two guys, Sam Laporta and Luke Lechie. Luke Lechie was a high four-star guy, and both of them should be very productive. Mm-hmm. O-line is always strong for them. They have a lot of good young talent on the defense, resulting from their improvement in recruiting. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to show a lot this year. They got some experience in the secondary and on the D-line, but they've got some freshmen and sophomores. Only like one or two freshmen, but like four or five sophomores starting on the defense because they're very talented and they all fit what Iowa wants to do. Yeah. Iowa should get seven or eight wins as usual. Mm -hmm. Typical Iowa team, good for Iowa fans. Minnesota, still trying to roll the boat back to success. (laughs) 10-win season a few years ago, everything just came together. They had Tyler Johnson and Rashad Bateman going crazy for them as receivers. Yep. They just had a really good season. Now, Tanner Morgan is back for his fifth year, I believe. Yeah. He's got the bald head. He looks like he's almost in his 30s. There was a lot of promise for Tanner Morgan at one point. Yeah. Um, Last year, uh, a bit. there were a lot of changes in coaching and injuries that didn't come together last year. Yeah. But you have Tanner Morgan, who is reliable when, every, when everybody's healthy, and Muhammad Ibrahim, who's one of the more underrated running backs in the conference. He had a couple monster games. Yeah, they, they give, them, give him the ball a lot, and he breaks a ton of tackles. He's going to have a, more big games this season. Now, underrated talent in the receiving core. They got a transfer named Dylan Wright from Texas A&M. Big body guy, 6'4", over 200 pounds. And they got some young guys that can make plays, too. On the defense, it's kind of uh, – I don't know how to put it. There's, I, I think there's going to be inconsistency. They lost Benjamin St. Juice to the draft, big-bodied corner. They're replacing him with guys that are there but haven't don't have much experience. That's the thing for most of the defense. It's either transfers or guys that don't have a lot of experience. Mm-hmm. And they have a few transfers on the D-line from Clemson and another big school. I can't remember. but. Yeah, they're reshuffling a lot of stuff on defense. I think they're going to rely on trying to put up, trying to put up a, a big points over thirty mm-hmm. in several games. They might only win five games, but Minnesota should be back on track within a year or two because they they're recruiting very well. Purdue, 
Things have not come together for Jeff Brom. It's a make or break year for him. Jack Plummer was named the starting QB. 6'5", big body guy, good arm, but he has to be more consistent. Worst running back room in the Big Ten. <laughs> no standout guys. Their starter is going to be a guy named King Doru, I believe, who's been there for a long time but hasn't stood out. Another guy named Zach Horvath, who was a guy that was a linebacker that they made a running back last year. Didn't do a lot, but he's tough. Gets tough yards, I think. Mm -hmm. Their receivers are going to have to be huge. David Bell, who I believe is one of the best receivers in the country, going to be in the NFL very soon. And a guy named Milton Wright, who's had a lot of athleticism, but hasn't put it all together. He's 6'3". They got to target them a ton because the receiving, I mean, the running backs aren't very reliable. Yeah. Then you have a few standouts on defense. George Karloftis, who's a high-level defensive end, going to be an NFL guy, and a few DBs who are on a high level too. But as a whole, they just don't have it. Mm -hmm. If they don't make a bowl, if they don't get six wins, Jeff Brown might be gone, and they might not get that done. Yeah. Now, wrapping up this, week zero, Illinois, Nebraska, first game of the season. Scott Frost coming up short once again. Yep. Adrian Martinez started slow. The team lost confidence. He started to pick it up a little bit, but then there was not much around him to help. Mm -hmm. Oliver Martin, who started at Michigan, went to Iowa, and is now at Nebraska, had six catches, a few big plays, but nothing that added to anything substantial. Yeah. Their defense just, once they got punched in the mouth, it looks like they couldn't really recover. Running game, they got a, a transfer from USC that looked pretty good, got a touchdown, but they didn't give them enough carries. Well, Adrian Martinez led their rushing 17 yeah. carries, 111 he, yards because he had one big 75-yard yeah, touchdown. Broken coverage, had one big run. Illinois, good for Brett Bielema, man. He's just a Big Ten coach and knows what he's doing in this conference. Mm-hmm. He knows exactly how to win in the Big Ten. And Illinois might surprise within two or three years because he's going to get some recruits in because he's going to pull off a few surprise wins. This one was a great step. Brandon Peters got hurt. Art Sikowski came in, played well. I'm sure they're going to want Brandon Peters back. Yeah. But they've got a good enough amount of talent on both sides of the ball. Illinois could be good throughout the season. Mm-hmm. Not good enough to make a bowl, maybe. But they, they're they going to improve a lot. Now, Nebraska. Dark days in Nebraska right now. I don't know. Scott, Scott Frost, Frost might be gone mm-hmm. if they don't hit six or seven wins. And that might be the optimistic look, six or seven wins. Yeah. Because what he tried to bring to Nebraska just isn't working. Mm-hmm. It just isn't. The recruits he got at UCF, you weren't getting them at Nebraska. They all left within your first few years. You got to try to be like Iowa or Wisconsin if you're at Nebraska. Yeah, You're not going to get the top, top recruits. You got to play a tough brand of football if you're at Nebraska. And, and they got a tough schedule. Yeah. They got Oklahoma in a few weeks. Oh, man. That's... And then their, uh, their final stretch of games, their last three games, first Ohio State. As was at Wisconsin and versus Iowa. It's not looking good. Good night. Listen, they, they better cherish the few wins they get this season. Yeah. And hopefully they bring in a guy shooting for the moon. It would be Matt Campbell from Iowa State. But he could probably come in and establish that type of system that would work for Nebraska. This type of high-flying, trying to bring in high-recruited athletes, those guys didn't want to be in Nebraska. As soon as they got to Nebraska, they left. Yeah. And the guys he kept, he had to bring in transfers for a receiver because the receivers he recruited weren't good enough, apparently. Some guys he's just not given enough opportunities. They still make sloppy mistakes. They still look bad overall. And he's stuck with Adrian Martinez through all the mistakes, and it still isn't working out. Yep. And that's how we wrap up the Big Ten. Crazy. We're on to week one. There's a lot of question marks outside of Ohio State, basically. As usual. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Please say it changes within the next four or five years. Please. Well. Somebody do something. We'll see what happens week one. God. This has been Views from the Sideline. We'll see you guys next week where we get to talk about the Lions. Everybody's looking forward to that one. And the NFC North. We'll talk the about fighting that. Jared Goffs. Just turn your head and golf. I don't know why I laughed. That was a good, terrible joke. But it was...